want to begin this morning by talking about one of the greatest baseball players to ever play the game. Pete Rose was absolutely one of the greatest in the history of the sport. He was a once in a generation sort of talent that had a long and storied career, and um, he absolutely earned a place in the Hall of Fame. But he was kicked out of the Hall of Fame, and he will not be reinstated to the Hall of Fame for the rest of his life. Why? Because he broke rule number 21. Now, I don't know what the other 20 rules that came before rule 21 are, but I know that Pete broke rule 21. And rule 21 was started in 1927. It was written then because the Chicago White Sox had uh, thrown the 1919 World Series. Uh, They had taken money from gamblers to lose the series on purpose. And after that, the Major League Baseball implemented rule 21, which states that if any player, official, coach, manager, anyone involved in an organization bets on a game in which they are involved, they will be banned from baseball for life. And since the time that it was implemented, every player has agreed to follow Rule 21, not just, not just when they begin their career, but they are reminded, they are required to agree to follow that rule at the beginning of every season. It is posted in every locker room in every major league baseball club in the, in the nation. It is all over the place be, that if you bet on baseball while in a game you're performing in, you will be banned from baseball for life. Now, to some people, it seems maybe a little extreme. He's already been out of the hall for 30 years, 30 plus years, right? It may seem a little extreme, but people who know baseball really well, even people who are Pete Rose fans would agree that he should not be reinstated. Not because of him, not because of who he is, not because he hasn't shown enough contrition, not because he hasn't cried enough tears about it, not because of anything to do with him, but because because of baseball. They say that he shouldn't be reinstated because of baseball. Now, think about this. A a couple of years back, Calvin Ridley, a player in the National Football League, he was found to have bet on football games in which he was playing, and he was suspended for one year. He had a one-year suspension. What are the chances that he does that again? I don't know. I can't calculate the odds. I'm not, you know, well, I'm not, I'm not a gambler, right? I, I don't know what the odds might be, right? I can't give you any action on that, right? I, I don't know what the odds are, but I do know this. The chances that an NFL player will bet on an NFL game are higher than a Major League Baseball player betting on a Major League Baseball game because the penalty, the price is so much higher. Baseball has decided that that there are some things, Rule 21 being one of them, that that rule is more important than Pete Rose. It's more important than any player. It's more important than any team. It is important because it is the heart of baseball to know that it is a fair competition. They've decided that that's what's most important. Today, I want to talk about Rule 21 for the church. We're going to talk about Rule 21 for the church and it is a rule that, uh, that we have to treat as if it is bigger than us. It is a commandment that we have to treat that is bigger than us because it cuts to the heart of what it means to be the church. It cuts to the heart of what it means to be a Christian and a follower of Jesus. It, it is an essential component of having unity in the church. Today we're going to look in Ephesians chapter 5. And we will find out about this rule and uh, also get some context and background to it. So uh, we'll be in Ephesians chapter 5. Now Paul is still, he's kind of taking up this idea of what it means to have unity in the church. And one of the reasons or one of the ways that Paul is insisting that we have unity in the church is that we have sort of clear roles, right? Clear roles and responsibilities. Who does what? Who is responsible to whom? Who is leading? Who is following? That sort of thing. And, and I think we can see that today. The importance of, of having clearly assigned roles and responsibilities, right? Um, we have to uh, apparently have to assign the role of filling up the baptistry 
to someone else, right? It needs to be a clearly assigned responsibility. And so that person, I guess probably me, knows that when we have a baptistry, you get in here a couple of days, fill it up, turn the warmer on and all of those things. I guess first call Brad, figure out how to turn on the, the baptistry, you know, all the stuff, right? Um, and so Paul says, if, if you're gonna have unity in the church, unity works best, the church functions best if there are clear roles, right? And we, we can understand that. Like we see that in our place of work, right? If everyone came up and everyone decided that they were boss for the day, it would just be chaos. It'd be such disorder, right? There, there has to be sort of a, of a pecking order and that having clearly assigned roles and having responsibilities and people being accountable to other people, it helps us to be able to work in a united sort of way. And so that's what he is taking up in Ephesians chapter five, and in fact, a good portion of the book of Ephesians. And in, in chapter five, verse 15, he says this, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. He's saying if you're going to be a part of a church, if you're going to be a part of this new Christian community in the world, that we have to be careful about how we walk. We have to walk as one who is wise, not as one who is unwise. And this is a call to walk wisely in this world, and that this world is, is filled with darkness, this world is filled with darkness. There are the ideas and philosophies that are being bandied about in this culture of ours are, are dark. There is a lot of dark thinking going on. And so we have to be careful about how it is that we walk. In fact, the world promotes a lot of unwise choices and actions. A lot of what the world promotes is, is driven by selfishness. It's built on selfish desires and certainly on ungodly desires. But our calling is to live a life of righteousness. And that is, that is not self-centered. In fact, if you look at the, the calls upon our righteousness that are given throughout the Bible, they are God-centered. Our call to righteousness is to place God first in our lives, to put God above all else, and then we don't get to then immediately start thinking about us. Right? It's not like, well, I have, I've, I've paid my tithe, I've given my time, I've done what I'm supposed to. Now, me, that's not it. The call to righteous living is to put God first, but then under that is you put your community. You put the, the people that you are living with, your family, your spouse, friendship, your church, is to put a community mindset above a selfish mindset. And that's not the way that, that this world of ours works. It's not the way, it's not the sort of the philosophy that our world promotes. The world's wisdom is largely based on temporary pleasures, but God's wisdom is based on eternal truth and its aim is to grow the kingdom. And so whether it is pursuing material wealth or at the expense of relationships or unhealthy addictions. There are so many behaviors that the wise person avoids. And so we have to actively seek wisdom. We seek wisdom through prayer, through studying God's word. We seek wisdom through uh, seeking after godly counsel to help us to make wise choices. Um, and, and I'd like for us to just think about what is at stake when we walk unwisely. What is at stake when we walk unwisely in this darkened world? A few months ago, I walked unwisely in a darkened room. I, I, I wasn't walking. I ran unwisely through a darkened room and stepped on a Lego on a tile floor. And I have been in this boot for two months now. And there, that's been the consequence, right? That's been the, the payment for, for not walking carefully. Here's the thing, though. I would stay in this boot for years rather than walk unwisely in relationships. Man. Because, I mean, this, the, the boot's a real inconvenience to me and uh, inconvenience, I guess, to the kids, second, because they're like my gophers now. You know, I haven't gotten myself uh, anything from the fridge in like two months, right? So, um, you know, so it's, it's good. I'm, I'm just waiting on them to start putting me on a, you know, <laughs> on, a, on a plan. Now, you, you, had, you had a Dr. Pepper an hour ago. You've got, you know, an hour and a half till you get your next one. Um, but they haven't yet. So uh, it's, it's been inconvenient for them. But think about the impact that walking unwisely in relationships has. 
Think, think about how when we don't take ordered steps, when we choose to do unwise things, think about the havoc that that wreaks in relationships. I hope that you don't know this from personal experience. I hope that your family has never had anyone in it with a drug addiction. I hope that's never happened to you. But if it has, you understand. If you've seen a family where, where that has taken hold, man, you, you wish you had a time machine that you could go back and tell that person, walk wisely. Walk wisely. Choose your steps carefully. Choose your steps carefully. And we normally have a pretty ordered household. My, my wife, she, she runs a pretty tight ship. Um, and, you know, we have things very ordered and try to keep things, you know, with, with the kids and jobs and everything. It's just, it works a lot better to have a lot of order. And I'll say this, living an ordered life where you've really kind of thought through what you're doing tomorrow and the next day, and you're making a menu every Sunday, and, and you're just planning every, it's exhausting, like deliberate, intentional living is exhausting. A couple of weeks ago, our water heater exploded and put water all over the place. And so we're, we're actually right now living in a hotel and we don't have a menu and we don't know what we're wearing tomorrow. Our clothes for the week aren't laid out and it is chaos. And let me just tell you, accidental living is exhausting. Right? It's even more exhausting than deliberate living, more exhausting than intentional plan out every single step living. It's hard. So life is going to be difficult. So you choose your difficulty. You choose your difficulty. You choose in the morning, I'm going to wake up and my first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to say prayers. I'm going to say my, my good morning prayers is what we call them in our family. I'm going to start, start every day with my good morning prayers. I'm going to start every day with a devotional. I'm going to read my Bible every morning. And yes, okay, that means I'm going to have to wake up 15 minutes earlier than I would otherwise. And that's 15 minutes less sleep and maybe 15 minutes earlier to bed the night before. And, and yes, it, it changes the order of things. <sighs> but it injects wisdom into your life. Making those deliberate decisions, making those decisions, it, it injects order and wisdom into your life. And it helps us to make sure that our steps are careful. In verse 16, Paul says, making the best use of time because the days are evil. See, we have to seize opportunities in this world because this life is brief. This life is brief. And I think its brevity certainly it gives a sense of, of how precious life is. When, when we lose someone, when we lose a friend, a loved one, we cherish the moments that we had with them. We look back on them. We reflect on them. Yesterday, my son asked me, what was, what was the best summer of your life? And like I answer most of his questions, I don't know. Go ask your mother what the best summer of my life was. Um, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't know, right? And, and so, and he, he, you know, wouldn't let it go. He kept asking, what, so really, what was it? Think about it. And I said, uh. And, I, you know, I kind of figured out that the best summer of my life was probably this one time my, my parents and I went on a vacation. And, um, and I told him, I was like, and honestly, I was a total, I was a real brat about it. I was a brat about the vacation because my older sister wasn't going. It was just me and my parents. And I was at an age where I thought my parents were just so uncool. And, you know, I just, at the time, I just wanted to be anywhere but there. I wasn't getting to go to this camp because I was going on this vacation with them. And it wasn't even a real vacation. It was a work trip of my mom's that we just kind of tacked on a, a hotel stay on each end of it to make it a vacation. And, and I said, you know, but looking back, it was the best trip I can remember growing up. It was the best trip. And I wish that, you know, I could go back and, you know, have a different attitude about it. But those times, they're precious. And they're precious because this life is brief. This life, this life is not eternal. 
And so because this life is brief, because this world that we live in is dark, we have to seize opportunity. We, can't, we cannot waste our lives pursuing selfish things. We can't have a bunch of self-centered pursuits that drive our daily activity, but instead we have to do the things that God calls us to do, to use our time wisely in service to him and in service to others. See, we can, we can waste our time in a lot of different ways. And some of, them, some of them aren't even like morally wicked things, right? There's, there are some things that are just kind of morally neutral, right? They're, they're neither good nor bad. Earning a living isn't good or, or bad necessarily in and of itself, but you can have an unhealthy relationship with making money. You can. You can have an unhealthy relationship with that. Television, video games, entertainment of any kind, reading books, it, in and of itself, it's morally neutral, but you can have an unhealthy relationship with it. You can make too much of it. So we have to pursue God's priority. We have to invest our time in meaningful pursuits for God's purpose. Now, let me talk just a minute for how it is that we get this wrong. I think we get this wrong in this way. I think we tend to divide up our time, right? And I think maybe, I think maybe planners are to blame, right? Some of you guys, I know some of you guys are, are, are still, even though you can put all of your activities and stuff into your phone, you're still carrying around one of these bad boys, aren't you? Some of you are planner people. You carry around a planner that looks like a trapper keeper from the 80s, right? And it's got like, you know, you've got the receipts, you've got the appointment schedules, you've got sticker tabs over here and different colored pens and all of the things. And, and I think maybe that is part of what's responsible for this because we look at our time and so we say, all right, well, I'm gonna be at work for all of these hours. So for 40 to 50 hours a week, my time belongs to work. Okay, and then every evening, you know, I've got, to, I've got to come up with something to eat and I've got to eat it. That's like another hour and a half, but let's call it family time. I'll get the kids involved. I'll make them clean up or something, right? So, you know, and then we put up, maybe we'll say two hours a day for family time, five days a week. So 10 hours of family time. And then we say, okay, well, and then let's, we'll watch maybe an hour of television. So five tapes, and this will maybe five hours a week for entertainment. And then, then it's bedtime and bedtime, depending on how old your kids are, that could take anywhere from, you know, 30 minutes to three hours. And so you schedule that and you say, that's more family time. And you put that in there. And then it's Saturday, you say, well, Saturday is, Saturday's me time. And so I'm going to spend Saturday on the lake, but not every Saturday. I'm not selfish. And so I'm not going to spend every Saturday at the lake, just like every other Saturday. You know, and I'll just spend like eight hours every other Saturday at the lake. And then on the other Saturdays, I'll just go play golf which is only five hours, you know, to play a round of golf or whatever. So or four hours, right? Maybe you're real, you know, you can play it faster. So, and, and that's just, you know, kind of me time. And then, and then you say, well, and then church will be an hour and a half on Sunday. And that's the Lord's time. That's the Lord's time. The reality is that we should take our planners and you should like take a highlighter and down like that left-hand column where it has all of the different hours, 8 a.m., 9 a.m., 10, just highlight them all. And then at the bottom, right, God's time. Because it's all God's. Like every hour of your day, God has given you. God has given you those hours and he's given them to you to use wisely. And the wise use of those hours is probably 40 hours at work and some hours of family time and some hours in church and some hours doing service and maybe and some TV in there maybe to unwind a little bit. But recognize that all of that time is God's time. And I think if you recognize that, that those hours that you're spending at work, that you're using them at work, but they actually belong to God, I think maybe that can change your priority of, of what you're doing at work, right? So that as you're, you know, selling things, as you're teaching kids, as you're checking gauges, as you're watching the whole, right? Whatever it may be, that you're, you're doing your job and you're looking for opportunities to redeem the time, to make the most of this time for the Lord and for the kingdom of God. 
right? So that, so that as you're teaching, maybe you're slipping in every chance you get a little bit of your faith, right? So that as you're sitting having lunch in, in the break room, that, that you're talking about a passage of scripture that you read that morning. So you're, you're doing what you can to redeem the time. So that as you're, as you're in class, as you're going to school, as you hear the other kids in your class talking about subjects that are probably not appropriate, that you certainly wouldn't want your parents to listen to that conversation, maybe you steer that conversation to something of a more godly pursuit. You talk about service. You talk about kindness. You, you, in your language, you, you say things that are true and necessary and kind. And you pepper your language with those sorts of gracious things. You redeem the time that way, recognizing that it all belongs to God. In verse 17, he says, Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And so he's, he means here that seeking God's will, that seeking God's will means we have to understand his purposes. And so we discern things, we discern the things of this world through a spiritual lens. We have to understand things spiritually, right? So that, so that the encounters that you have are not just random encounters, so that they, they're meaningful. Because all of that time belongs to God, right? All of that time belongs to God. And so wherever it is that you find yourself, God made that appointment. Whether you made that appointment or not, God made that appointment. And so we, we dismiss the idea of accidents. We dismiss the idea of, of accidents and we say, no, this isn't an accident that this thing happened here at this time at this place. And instead we say, all right, Lord, what do you want? <laughs> Which, and maybe it, that came out a little bit rougher sounding than I meant it to, right? But we say, all right, Lord, what, what is it that you have for me to do here and now? So some, a worker comes into your, to your house to fix something, all right? AT&T sent that person out. And maybe for AT&T, that was a real random assignment. But, but maybe God was in the algorithm that sent that laborer into your house to fix your internet. Maybe so. I use that example because several years ago, I, I led a young man to the Lord who was in my office fixing my internet. And I don't know if maybe our situation was really bad or if he just wasn't very good at his job or if he just really liked hanging out with me, but it took him like four days. It took him like four days to fix the internet. And the whole time he was like, I don't understand why this is taking so long. I don't understand why this is taking so long. And the whole time I was sitting there saying, oh, Lord, do you really, is this, is he, is he here for more than the internet? Is he here for the more than the internet? And the whole first day, I didn't, I didn't even open my mouth to say anything about Jesus. We were literally sitting in a church office and I didn't mention the gospel one time. And I said, oh Lord, if he comes back again, I'll, I'll, say, I'll say something. And he came back again and again and again. Our time, it doesn't belong to us. Our, our appointments, they're divinely appointed. He is doing these things. He has, he has a will. He has a spiritual purpose in the things that are going on in this world. And we have to be sensitive to that. We have to be cognizant of that to recognize that God is doing things here. And, and not just in other people. Like the story of the growth of the kingdom, the story of the spreading of the gospel, it isn't someone else's story. It is your story. It's your story. You're part of that. Now, your chapter of sharing and spreading the gospel, it might be really boring. It might be really boring. Your chapter might read, someone came into, I'm gonna, sorry, Kyle, I saw you, you stood out from the crowd. Someone came to Kyle's, by Kyle's, someone ran into Kyle's truck at the intersection of Bear Path and 11, whatever it is over there, and, and they had to sit by the side of the road for two hours, and that person was cussing up a storm and crying and upset, and Kyle kept his mouth shut about Jesus. That's a boring chapter, Kyle. That's a boring chapter, 
See, but I think Kyle knows better. Kyle would say, I'm a perfect driver, so if this happened, if this happened, it must have been the will of God to make this happen. And it's happened for a reason. And so I won't overlook the possibility that this is an opportunity to share the gospel with someone that needs to hear it. So we won't be foolish, but we'll understand that God's will is being exercised throughout our lives. I think maybe something that would be important for us to do is to think about when we've gotten this wrong. Can you think about a time you've gotten this wrong? Can you remember a time where you thought, Lord, is this, is this happening because you want to teach me something deeper? Is this happening because you want to teach me something greater or you want to use me to do something for your kingdom? And maybe you sat there at that table in that restaurant and you just psyched yourself out and you just talked yourself out of opening your mouth. But next time, that's the great thing, right? Because you're all here today. You're all here today, so there's, there's a next time. There's another opportunity. You're going to go somewhere to eat today or, or, or maybe you're gonna go to a store if you have to buy groceries today or tomorrow, right? Or, or maybe, I mean, maybe you live the total hermit lifestyle. You never leave the house. The groceries are delivered, but I don't buy it. I don't buy it because here's the thing. Even if your groceries are delivered, you can wait at your, at your door and that Walmart delivery person, you can, you can talk to them about the gospel. None of us live lives of total isolation. We're all engaging with people every day. And if we see through the lens of what God is wanting to accomplish through us, we can go from getting it wrong to getting it right. Verse 18, he says, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. So we have to choose a spiritual sobriety and the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And there, you know, he uses drunkenness here, but there is an allure of drunkenness, but also of gluttony, of making money, of video games. There's an allure of many, many things in this world, but we choose to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We choose to be filled with, with God's Spirit because that puts us in the right place, that moves us in the right direction. See, the things of this world that we can get intoxicated with lead us in bad places. They lead us to bad places. They can lead us to a loss of control. They can lead us to impairment. But being filled with the Holy Spirit brings clarity. It brings empowerment. It brings spiritual fruitfulness. And so what is the life? What is the role of the Holy Spirit in your life, rather? Have you found the importance of the Holy Spirit yielding, giving you guidance? Having a life in the Holy Spirit should transform our lives. It should empower us to do things for his kingdom. Verses 19 and 20, Paul says, Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we are to address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Now, that does not mean that every time we see one another, right, that we have to necessarily lift song to each other, right? Like, I'm not gonna be like, you know, next time you see me at Kroger, I expect you to sing How Great Thou Art as I'm, or, you know, Amazing Grace as I, we're, it's not that. It's not saying that this is like how we're supposed to greet each other, but it's that, it's that there should be a song in our hearts. There should be a song in our hearts, a, a psalm, a hymn, a spiritual song. And that as we are together, that these songs should fill our mouths, our lungs, and our minds. That these should be the things that, that we focus our thoughts on. Right? It, it, it points us to this fact, and that is that, that worship is powerful. And it's not just powerful when we're together. It's not just powerful corporately. It's powerful 
It's powerful individually. It's, it's powerful in your living room. It's as powerful in your living room as it is in this room. It's as powerful in your car by yourself as it is here together or in a Sunday school class. Worship is, is powerful. It's, it's spiritual dynamite. And so our minds, our voices ought to be engaging in the act of worship, not just here, but, but kind of all the time. And he, he breaks this idea of, of worshiping into three parts. And he says, you know, that there are psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And psalms are simply, that's the word of God. In fact, you know, we have obviously the ones that are in the middle of your Bible. Those are psalms. Uh, but I think a bigger concept here is that we can take the word of God and we can bathe our lives in it. The Psalms are a great place to start because there's so much wisdom and comfort in the Psalms that you could probably open this afternoon. In fact, maybe try this. Open to any Psalm and, and start reading. And just read until you think, wow, that's, that's comforting. That's a help to me. I know I, growing up, Psalm 56.3 was a Psalm that, that I would sort of uh, repeat to myself again and again and again. Psalm 56.3 says, I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to make you look it up. Don't look it up now. Look it up when you get home. Psalm 56.3. I, I probably said that psalm to myself, goodness, a hundred times a week, uh, maybe a thousand times a month. I see you. You're going to your phone right now. Don't look it up now. Look it up later. Be dedicated. All right. Psalm 56.3. Um, and, and here's the thing. When you read it this afternoon, you can say, ask yourself, is that a psalm that you could repeat to yourself? Would it be meaningful to, to preach that over your life on a regular basis? One last time, Psalm 56, 3. Um, so that's psalms, that's scripture. And then there's hymns. And hymns aren't necessarily scripture. A lot of hymns will reference scripture. They'll talk about scripture. But hymns are, are simply just songs about faith. They're songs about God's story. They're songs that are, are teaching doctrine, which is connected back. We, our doctrine is connected to the scriptures. It's connected to the story of God's encounters with people. Um, but they're not simply scripture. They're people being creative in understanding and sharing scripture together. All right. In fact, we see an example of, of Jesus singing psalms in uh, Matthew 26, 30, right? Matthew 26, 30, Jesus has washed the disciples' feet. He has broken bread with them for the Last Supper. He is on his way to the Garden of Gethsemane where he will pray and he will uh, sweat blood where he will then be betrayed. He will then go to be tried and denied and crucified. And before that happens, he and the disciples sing, psalm, sing hymns together. Before he goes into that time of intense prayer and just the, the most agonizing experience of his entire life, before he faces that, he gathers with his disciples and they sing, sing hymns together. There is immense value, immense value in worshiping together, in taking these, these poems set to music and sharing them together. He also says, that we sing spiritual songs. And this is a more general sort of way of understanding that a psalm could be a spiritual song, a hymn could be. But there, a spiritual song is distinct from these other two in that typically the spiritual songs are, are a direct address. It is us speaking to God, and it can be just about our experiences. And sometimes our spiritual songs, we, we may hear them on the radio you may hear it on, on K-Love or, or something. You may see it, hear it on a, on a Sunday morning and something about the song resonates with you and that becomes a spiritual song that you sing over yourself. This week I shared with, um, with Kimmy a song that I wanted to sing next week and it's a song that resonates with me and, and my experience and it's something that, it's a song that I have sung sort of again and again in life and I, I mentioned the song to her and she said, is it okay? She said, you mean the song that I sang at my mom's funeral? I said, yes, that's the one. And she says, mm. Mm -hmm. let me think about it. Let, let, me, let me see if I'm, if I'm ready to sing that song. Because over the last couple of years, I've sung that song, and I've heard that song, and I've turned that song off. It, 
it still resonates. It's still meaningful. In fact, maybe, maybe too, too meaningful. These spiritual songs, we need them in our lives. Right? We need them in our lives. We need these reminders of, of what our experience is. Even, even when you hear that song and it just stops you. Even when it just stops you in your tracks and you're either going to stop driving the car <laughs> because you're crying or you're going to have to turn off the radio, right? Even then, we, we need that exposure in our lives. We need to remember God's goodness and his faithfulness even in trying times. And so we pepper our speech with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And then verse 21. And this I think is the is the appropriate climax. This is the apex of everything that Paul has been has been getting to, right? That that we are to be people who are making the most of our time, making the most of our lives, that we with everything that we we see and say and do with that when we are around each other, we fill our voices with praise of psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And all of this leads to this. And this is sort of the defining, the sort of capstone of it in verse 21, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is a call to mutual submission in Christian relationships. Now, we live in a world that promotes dominance. We live in a world where submission is always a negative thing, right? Submission is, is how a fight ends, right? That's how, how a fight ends. One fighter says to the other, you know, they tap out, they submit. They don't want to. The last thing in the world that they want to do is submit, right? I, I see this in, in my family a lot. I've got the Lord saw fit to bless me with two sons, five years apart. And, and so one of them is physically dominant over the other. There's no question that when Dax and Dutch start to wrestle, how it's going to end, right? It's clear from the beginning, Dax is going to win. He has, I don't know, he, you weigh like 35 pounds more than Dutch, right? Like Dutch has no chance. And yet every fight, every wrestling match that, that they both willingly enter into ends with Dax on top saying, tap out. And Dutch saying, never. I don't want to tap out. I shouldn't have to tap out. I shouldn't have to. And I'm like, Dutch, just tap out. I don't want to. Like literally your face is turning purple. Tap out. I've tapped out of more fights for Dutch than he has, right? Like come on, stop, stop, stop. Let him breathe. That's us. That is us. And everything in our world tells us that submission is the last thing you want. It's the last thing. Even, even our marriage vows, right? Even our marriage vows. The world, when was the last time you saw a wedding on television or in a movie that said love, honor, and obey? Ooh, obey. Mm-mm. We don't want to put that into the wedding vows. People might get the wrong idea of marriage. But that's the call. The call is that we submit one to another. Now, Paul's gonna go on in the next several sections. He's gonna talk about husbands and wives and slaves and masters. He's gonna talk about children and parents. And all of these are just examples of the relationships, examples that take this idea of mutual submission and applies them to specific scenarios. But this idea of mutual submission should be paramount in our thoughts of living as Christians. It is not simply that because this one is the teacher that what they say goes and these just submit. It's mutual submission. The teacher teaches, the teacher leads, but he leads being sensitive to what the people 
need. It should be the case that a husband leads his family not based on what he wants, that a husband leads the family not based on getting optimal amount of time on the lake or the links, but that he, he leads his family in what is best for the whole family. He submits his time to the, to the needs of, of the whole family. It's, it's mutual submission. It should be that husbands and wives submit to each other, that parents and children have a sense of mutual submission, that both value the other and value each other's needs so that neither one expresses such dominance that the other feels like they are being in some way oppressed or held down. See, Paul even took the relationship of slaves and masters, which is you know, a, a relationship that has been so horribly, horribly used throughout history and has, set, has shown just such egregious evil. And Paul takes it and he says, no, 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 not like that. Don't do it like that, not, not that way, not anymore. If you're going to be a Christian and you're going to have people who submit to your authority, and whether they are slaves or employees, you, you don't do it like that. It isn't, I'm going to put my will over you and I'm gonna hold you down until you are per- turning purple. It should be, I'm gonna to submit to your needs while you submit to mine. It should be a loving relationship. Because that's what, that's what makes relationships better. It's what makes our families better. It's what makes our, our churches better. It's what even makes companies better. This past week, our world was captivated with the, this Titan situation with the submarine, ended in tragedy. And one of the things that I found so telling about this whole thing is talking or reading interviews where people were talking about their encounters with the CEO of this company that there were all of these people who said, this won't work. All of these people who ran the numbers, who did the math, who knew the science and said, this isn't safe. And anytime he found someone who said, this isn't safe, rather than sit and submit to accept that they hold some authority, that they hold knowledge, he dismissed And instead of running his business in a way of mutual submission, it was his way. And everyone else did not get the respect that they should have been given. And it ended in tragedy. That's not how the world, well, that is how the world works. That's how the lost world works. But that's not how the church works. It's not, it's not how Jesus worked. It's not how Jesus worked because I would say that there's no better sign of Christian maturity than submission. The, amil- the ability to humble yourself and to put someone else's needs above your own is a, is a mark of Christian maturity. It is the antithesis of rebellion, and I think that its, its ultimate sign was seen in Jesus, who though he was himself God, he humbled himself to take on the form of a servant who in that garden prayed, not my will, but your will be done. Who was in every way co-equal to the Father and yet submitted to suffer and to die because he put the needs of those he loved above his own physical needs. This is what we need in the church. It's what we need in our homes. It's what we need in our relationships. We need Rule 21. We need a Rule 21 that we say, you know what, this idea of mutual submission, it's bigger than me. It's bigger than you. It's even bigger than a family. It's bigger than any one church. That this is, this is the heart of what it means to be a part of the kingdom of God. We have seen the Son of God exhibit this mutual submission We have seen the apostles showed mutual submission. They encouraged this. We have seen it again and again, and we've seen the kingdom grow in mutual submission, and we've seen the kingdom suffer. We've seen it suffer out of selfishness. We've seen it suffer out of my way or the highway thinking. And so we need to have mutual submission in our lives. 
My hope and prayer for us as a church is that, is that we can take this passage, we can take the direction that it is pointing our lives and say that this is, this is what we need to pursue. Because just as Rule 21 is bigger than Pete Rose, Ephesians 5.21 is bigger than me, it's bigger than you. And it helps to put us into our place. I wanna close this morning by looking at a, uh, a painting. I wanna look at a painting. This is Sunday, where is it? There, have you got it? There you go. Sunday on La Grande Jatte. It is a, a painting by Surratt. And it's, it's nice. You know, if, if somebody hung this in my house, I'd probably, you know, leave it there, right? It, it's, it's pretty enough. But what makes it fascinating, I think, isn't just that it's, you know, a nice composition with the people and the, you know, pleasant beach scene and various people doing various things. What really makes this interesting is that this was, um, this was painted using a style called ponchalism. And so, I'll show, we show that next slide, Charlotte? See, this is a zoomed in picture and you'll see that the whole painting is made up of individual dots. So when he took his brush to paint it, he didn't use his brush and make strokes, but he took just the tip of a very fine brush and he put one dot next to another, next to another, adding layer after layer, color after color, until he came up with the masterpiece that was there. I think sometimes, you know, I want to be a part of a masterpiece, right? I, I want to be a part of, of the kingdom of God that, that is beautiful, that is amazing. But the reality is, is that's not me, and that's not you, and that's not even our church. We're just a few little dots. We're just a few little dots here and there. And God has put us where he wants us to be so that we can create the masterpiece that he is painting. Can you imagine what would happen if these red dots up here, if they took it upon themselves to say that there needed to be just, that they needed to be much more dominant? And so they just insisted that all the dots start turning red. Eventually we would just have a red, pa red palette, right? That the whole canvas would just, would just be red. It all has to go that way. But that's not how art works. And that's, that's not how the kingdom works either. The kingdom works in us each having a role, having a spot, and doing what we're called to do. My hope is that you will be spiritually minded, that you will live a life in the spirit to say that you want to do what, the, what God is calling you to do, and that you will pursue that role in mutual submission that you will say, I want to do what God is calling me to do. I want to be a part of this church and this community. I want to do my part. And I want to do it in a, in a place of, of mutual submission. Because, well, because I revere Christ. Because of who Christ is, because of what Christ has done, I recognize that my own role is, is to be a follower. And so I submit to one another. Let's pray together. Most gracious Father, we thank you for this day. We, we thank you for this chance to be here together and to look at your word together. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be people that, that submit to one another. That we not be those people that say, no, it has to be this way. It has to be my way. You give us this message again and again through your word. When you describe what love is like, you would say that love does not insist on its own way. You give us the example of Jesus who says, your will be done. Lord, I pray that you would help us to say that your will be done. Open our eyes to see what you have for us to do. Open our hearts to pursue it. Help us to open our calendars to make the time for it. Lord, we know that this life is short. Help us to make the most of it for you and for your kingdom. 
Lord, I pray that in this time, if there's any here that doesn't know you, that needs to begin a relationship with you, I pray that you will take this opportunity, that your spirit would move in their heart today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd ask that you'd stand with me as you're able. We'll have a brief time of invitation, and then our, our men will come forward to begin distributing the elements for the Lord's Supper.